Excellent. So, good afternoon. I'm Frank Artez. And I'm Stefan Fry. This is Stefan Fry. I can't introduce him when he does it himself. Hello, Stefan. We're going to be presenting uh, some of our joint research today, uh, defense evasion modeling. Uh, this is actually based off of uh, research material that comes out of NSS Labs. Uh, just so I don't have to waste the time explaining it, uh, who's heard of NSS Labs? Uh, for everybody else, we are a uh, security product testing company uh, where we measure the efficacy of security products. Um, all of our reports are based on empirical data. There's no marketing crap. judgment or marketing crap. It's your product worked or it didn't, and this is on a scale of how it did it. Um, the data that you're going to see presented to you today is based on the empirical data that comes out of a lot of our testing. So when we're testing security devices that should be catching and blocking evasions, those being IPS products, next generation firewalls, endpoint protection products, browser security, um, these products are meant to detect when an exploit is being used against your workstation or your server, whether it is because the attacker initiated it, or because the user initiated the attack inadvertently, um, we measure what gets through these, these particular products as part of the methodologies for anything that's supposed to be on this. Stefan and I started looking at the data of the actual exploits that can get through the different products that we were testing, and the presentation that we're going to show you today is the discoveries that we made uh, by looking at those uh, exploits that completely evade these products, or as we'll talk about it, they go completely undetected. So I'm going to kind of glance over the first group of slides because we've got technical people in the room. Um, so throughout history, we know that new technologies uh, have revolutionized crime and warfare alike, right? We always have a paradigm where new technologies are utilized by those who are going to commit crimes at a faster rate than those who are to defend the public or defend, in our cases, corporations and so forth, can keep up with the new attacks that are being generated and new uses of such technology. Silicon is no different than tanks and gunpowder and, and any other means, chariots and so forth, in the past uh, to do things. Um, we've all seen this, I think, since we're all here at Good Sides and we're at Black Hat and DEF CON, we probably fit in the hobbyist to expert range you know, from everybody in the room. Uh, we all know what a script kitty is, so I don't have to explain that, so I'm already minutes ahead of my presentation. So when we look at the paradigm, we know that we have um, vandalism kind of is the domain of the script kitty, um, theft and so forth, a little bit out of their reach. We know that expert hackers produce and are the authors of crime markets or penetration testing tools or other security uh, you know, testing tools like medicine and so forth. We also know that this is the fastest segment that is growing inside the security market. We know that these tools come onto the market and they basically change. So our lower level unskilled hackers now have completely automated, completely commercialized, great UI type tools. For those of us that this is our almost 21st DEF CON, uh, we remember the days when that was not the case, right? So you, if you did get a security tool or you got somebody's sample code, it purposely was nerfed. Uh, they purposely removed sections of the codes so to be smart enough to put them back in. Uh, nowadays, we see a completely commercialized pieces. We'll see a couple examples of that. Anyway, that's really changed things. So now anybody, including my sister, my mom, who knows nothing really about computers, can now go and launch an exploit or malware campaign against any company or throw a big net uh, without really having to have much skills. We know that the security market's maturing. We see that the products come out. The UIs are fantastic. The quality assurance is actually really, really good on these products. Um, you know, they're developed for ease of use and for do-it-yourself. That never was the case in the past, right? Um, they actually come with service level agreements, which kind of blow my mind. Um, so implementing detection evasion. So we'll talk a little bit about development process of these. Stefan loves these slides because there's one section that really calls to his Swiss nature. Um, 
So we have uh, the, the creation of the malicious tool. So whether they write it, buy it, they lease it, they steal it, they get their hands on the tool. The next thing they do is they find innovation that they can build within the tool, and then they obfuscate. In other words, they create multiple permutations of that uh, particular evasion, or that particular uh, exploit in this case. So to force the evasions, they'll take the one thing they have, they'll, multiple, they'll create 100,000 versions of it. Then they do what? Step Swiss on quality. Quality. Swiss quality. They actually go and QC it. Right, so the people that are planning on attacking and building that are building these kits will sit there and do things that you don't do in your own corporation. They run every flavor of antivirus, and unlike the rest of us, theirs is actually updated. Right? They test their exploits against that. They test their exploits sometimes against inline tools. And then the remaining, let's say five thousand out of a hundred thousand, that's what they actually go to market with. So this produces this amazing, thriving underground market, right? So here are more examples of some of the tools, but some of my favorite parts of this is, A, they're not all that expensive. Remember when these things used to be like, you had to know somebody who knew somebody who winked at the right time, and like nudged their friends so they knew that you were in, and then you still had to come up with like 10, 10 large and like cash to get their tool. Now they're like 250 bucks and you can use PayPal half the time, right? They have service level agreements that have wonderful statements like, uh, they will give you a full replacement warranty if the creation is detected by any antivirus within nine months. How many of you have an antivirus that has the opposite claim? We will give you your money back if anything gets past our product within nine months. Like that's just never going to happen, right? So, and we know because we test them. So, our answer has always been layered security, right? We go in and we say, okay, we have an on-premises section. So this is our corporate infrastructure. We have servers, we have desktops. We add in a couple layers, typically speaking, that's our perimeter. If we're really sophisticated, the perimeter and all the inline network-based security goes all the way through, maybe to our core. If we're really, really lucky and have a large budget, we have things all the way back out to the work group switches. So we have things like our firewalls, our next generation firewalls. We have our IPSs. Then we're down to what's on the host after all of our network stuff is finished, right? So there we have the first line of defense typically with today's way of getting infected is through your browser, is browser security, right? So you see us testing the efficacy of browser security, which blows people's minds when we come out with things like actually Internet Explorer is one of the best right now at stopping malware, just is. Then you have on top of that antivirus, which is your last ditch effort your endpoint protection uh, product. We have two different types of attacks in this world. We have the direct attack, in other words, the one that everybody thinks we do, where we type at hacker speed, so you type three characters and 15 sentences pop up on the screen. And we fly through virtual mazes, because that's cool, we're actively attacking. It's the closest thing to a kinetic type attack, so it's the easiest thing for a consumer market to understand. The reality, of course, is that the indirect attack the attack that's initiated by the target is the most common and the most utilized because of the fact. Right? So your end users or your mom or whomever that goes to a website, may even be a legitimate website that has, I don't know, you know, base64 encoded JavaScript inside the website that launches something through their browser and then starts pulling down and dropping more malware onto their machine, opening up command and controls and next thing you know, their bank account has been emptied because they have Zeus, is the most popular way of infecting systems. Which means when we look at the next big problem that we have from a corporate security standpoint are our mobile users. That laptop goes out, well that laptop doesn't have perimeter security at all. Right? Starbucks doesn't have IPSs and next generation firewalls, neither does the airplane that you sat on, neither does the Wi-Fi here. Matter of fact, the Wi-Fi here is probably a testament to whatever you have as host-based security, right? So then you're just left with browser and antivirus. So the question comes up, how effective are your defenses? We all have a lot that we work with, right? So we have everything from hackers that we worry about, how do we harden and defend the mobile machines that we send out, how's our data slipping through our fingers, phishing attempts, you know, spear phishing, casting nets, whatever analogy we're using to talk about how obtuse or acute 
the phishing attempt might be against us. And then, of course, you got to deal with like the snobby guy and the security or IT department constantly never wants to cooperate. But that's like our daily lives. So I'm going to let Stefan speak a little bit. We're going to talk a little bit about our threat modeling in and of itself. What you'll see is, uh, I'm going to go show of hands, who has heard of Meltigo? Excellent. Who's used Meltigo? All right, who's a big fan of Maltigo? You're going to see some cool Maltigo transforms. So here are a lot of our transforms laid out. So uh, you'll, you'll recognize the double arrows, which are letting you know, of course, for the Maltigo users, that these transforms can be run in both directions. Right? We can start with an exploit, and take it to look at what applications those exploits target, and then we can come back from the application to find exploits, and we can go from primeware kits to look at which exploits are in primeware kits, or look at exploits and find the primeware kits that have them automated. You're going to see all that being done on stage live. Would you like to do this part? So yeah, um, we test security products, and uh, for this talk we have the data prepared for our test from the last 18 months. So we looked at the next, genera next generation firewall test, HFW 2010 to 2013 data. 2013 was released in February this year. We have the latest uh, IPS result from IPS 2012. The next IPS test will uh, we run in a couple of weeks or months, I think. And enterprise endpoint or antivirus. So when we look at those group tests, as we call them, each group test has a bunch of products, all the commercial products that need that uh, get have a market share of more than 80%. So NSS looks at uh, an enterprise grade stuff that is relevant for enterprises, and we look at the top products. So uh, failure rates we found within group tests are as high as 45%. For example, we, should, we should pause, I want that number to say. No Failure rates of products as high as 45%. I just, that's horrible. Like that's an F in most schools. How about in Switzerland? Would that be like a failing grade? You don't go to school. You don't go to school with this stuff. Yes. So uh, you'll, you're going to see fun facts like this on some of the bottoms of the slides. Uh, we'll, we'll point some out. We'll just wait to hear you gasp if we're under other ones. Okay, then uh, usually we do reports, and when you do a report, you always have a static view, a specific point of view where a report aggregates like the failure rate of such and such percent. When uh, we started to pull all those data into a database and look a little bit closer, uh, we were surprised to find correlation, correlation between, between what is missed on one device is also missed on another device. And uh, you could correlate the data to more metadata, like, okay, those exploits are missed. Well, where can I find those exploits? Oh, surprise, it's in Metasploit or the primary kit. So we have much more fine grade uh, possibilities, but it was still tied to our skills to write SQL queries. This yes. is good for us, but you cannot impress management or customers with that because you always have to do the queries to give the answer. Uh, so so I showed him in Altiga. <laughs> it lost me. Yeah, I, I lost my research partner for like a week because he uh, went away and learned how to write the transforms and didn't sleep for like seven days building the transforms that you're going to see. They've been, they've been fixed a little bit. He had some narcoleptic issues. But um, you can start a demo. Yep, okay. Yeah, it's been fun. Let's see what we can do with my TV. All right, so you're going to notice uh, that we're also running Tungsten, which is cool. Who, who saw? Roloff's presentation on tungsten history. Nobody. Right. New version of Maltigo allows you to do collaboration. Really cool stuff. That was my pitch. So, a couple things about the data that we're that we're going to be modeling today, just to save you guys some questions and help you follow along. The products that we're we're just we're demonstrating are the products that we're in our group testing. Group testing done by us is. Uh, we, we don't charge the group test. We make the money from our, our customers who buy the consumer reports that we put out. This means the methodology and the testing is absolutely as fair as it can be. The vendors don't get a say. Matter of fact, the vendors don't get a say if they're in the group test or not. Uh, we'll call them up and we congratulate them that their product is now in our group test. Uh, we let them know when the group test is taking place and when they can pick during that time period to come in with their SEs if they would like to set up their products and uh, take place during the first 24 hours of the group test, or first two business days, I should say. Uh, after that, we informally show them where the door is, and we continue the testing with them now out of the building. Um, 
during those two days, if they're uh, actually working with us on, like, for example, uh, IPS products, which you'll see over here, they tune the IPS products, right? So who here runs an IPS that isn't tuned? Everyone. Like, no hands, which is good. And that's why we let them tune it, right? So we do the same thing with, like, uh, enterprise endpoint protection. They can come in, like, McGaffey, Symantec, Kapernsky, and so forth. They come in, they get two days to tune for the methodology because nobody deploys enterprise endpoint protection without tuning it to customize it so it's not interrupting the workstations, right? Some people will look up methodologies and complain that we allow them to do that and that's not normal because their mom doesn't tune her antivirus, but we're not talking about consumer grade antivirus. We were measuring and grading enterprise uh, antivirus, which you can see I've kind of highlighted um, actually some of the enterprises over here. So with our IPS, we have tuned. The fun part is we actually run the test before they tune it and after they tune it. So here's another fun factoid for you. The difference in efficacy of the devices between their recommended settings and their best SE spending two days solid tuning their device is 65 to 85% performance increase. So what you're about to see modeled live on stage is 65 to 85% better than their recommended settings. Think about that when you start seeing how many exploits we model blowing past these things. The next generation firewalls, they run with just the recommended settings. We do this because we contact our customers and we say, great, you're buying NGFWs, how are you configuring them? Oh, like a stereo system. We check recommended, we plug it in in line, and off it goes. Great, that's how our methodology is written, because that's how it's actually used. They don't get to tune it. Right? Now, if they fixed their recommended settings before they showed up, fair game. It has to be generally available. Like They have to have published that code update to everybody, otherwise we call no-no, and we go back to what is actually GA at the time. This is only tracking now static points in time from the tests that we're about to show you. What's not included here are other tests that we did. Like we just finished and published today a breach, uh, or, uh, breach detection. Uh, group test, which is like FireEye, Kambala, and so forth. So everything I'm going to show you today is inbound exfiltration. Imagine if I start putting in the breach detection later, and I can show you now what gets passed if it's exfiltrating or opening up command and controls, and I now know which products miss which command and controls and which exfiltrations. This gets a little bit scary after this point. This is also the live, interactive, we are at B-Sides, which is totally cool portion of our presentation. So if we start with the 2013 Next Generation Firewalls, I know the screen is small, so I'm going to try and zoom in. Um, we have, I'll read the names for everybody in the room. We have uh, Stonesoft, Sourcefire, Watchguard, Fortigate, Stonesoft, Barracuda, uh, Checkpoint is off to the right, I happen to know that. Who would like to pick? An NGFW to be used in our test. Go ahead. I'd like the Palo Alto, please, for $300. You would like the Palo Alto for $300. Excellent. <laughs> I don't think you get a conference call with Palo Alto for $300. But. All right, so we have that. Now, we're going to take, and we're actually going to go pop him into a new clean frame. Uh, frame. We're going to go back to our other, where all of our products are listed. And we're going to go ahead and we're going to pick. Uh, fun with the screen here. There they are. Because of the bad resolution of the display of the uh, projector, I'm having a little bit of difficulty with it. We'll work on it. There we go. Would you like to pick an IPS? We're gonna we're gonna imagine that at your company you have so much budget that not only do you own a brand new shiny next generation firewall you also own a fully tuned, 65 to 85% better than average IPS. Would anybody like to pick one? Don't be shy, yeah? Sourcefire. Sourcefire, I love Sourcefire. They just got bought by Cisco, did you see that? All right, now we have a Sourcefire. Doesn't matter which one we pick, because they all run the same engine, right? The difference is, you know, how much, how fast they can move the data. Yeah, it would be pretty bad if they actually had the difference between the different products. They're, they actually run the same firmware. Their development is pretty cool. Actually, most of the vendors were like that. All right, great. Do we want to pick a uh, endpoint protection product? 
anybody like McAfee, Norman, Eset, maybe she? Yeah. McAfee. McAfee? All right, I'm picking on the elephant that we're in, I guess. I was going to pick Kerensky or anything. All right. All right. That's our corporate infrastructure at this point. There's obviously more pieces. We obviously test more pieces. This is all I have loaded on my database because I don't believe in doing live demos because I don't like being embarrassed. <laughs> because sometimes the inner tubes don't, uh, they don't cooperate. The first thing I want to know, what exploits out of the 2,000 CVEs that we ran are roughly thereabouts, except for, of course, the endpoint protection product. How many are we running as well? Uh, we run 43 exploits against the uh, endpoint protection yeah. and around 1,700 against larger network products. Yeah, so 43, so there's not going to be a lot of correlation with the endpoint products, but when there is, it's kind of exciting, just so that you understand there, the number is just really small. These are all CVEs, so everybody in the room is on the same page. These exploits are not zero days. How many of you think that somebody needs a zero day to break into your network? Uh, man, I can't bait anybody on this track. All right, those are the products. I'll zoom in so you can just see who they are. We'll be fair. This is the Palo Alto. That's everything it misses. It's like a Roman legion. This is probably the check one for the source fire mill. Right, that's what he misses. This is McGaffey. Now, it looks like he has a small group, but please remember that was out of 74. 43. Uh, 43. 43, it's even worse. So basically, we had uh, for those tests totally we used around 1,700 exploits, uh, targeting around 200 products. And when we look at the initial vulnerability database, those 200 products over the last 10 years, so our exploit set covered about 40% of those vulnerabilities covered those products. So yeah. It's massive oversampling. So. The beauty of this, and we, we say oversampling and so forth, because this was originally done by Stefan and I as an academic paper, uh, and then it turned into a product uh, that we offer with modeling and so forth. Um, so the data that we're showing you today was the data that we used for our white paper, which is being given out uh, for anybody that would like to download it from these sites. Um, so in this particular case, uh, what we're seeing, I'm actually just going to walk over a bit, because everything's so tiny. So this guy over here, those are the correlating exploits that get past at least two of the devices that we model. Uh, up here we see our antivirus, uh, and we've got two of the exploits that are actually get past the antivirus and get past everything that we've modeled as far as inline. So those will punch straight through everything that we have. And then we have literally the outliers, right? Yeah, go ahead. I like Maltico just for a minute. This is also always fun when you're like talking to somebody. And you're just like, this is very scary. No, I don't belong to you. All right. So, what we really care about in this particular case for the modeling purposes are these guys over here. There's all kinds of fun on this bad display. And those guys over there. Right? And we care about those because they punch through everything that we have. I'm actually going to ask them to come back into a different alignment. Now, because we're good people, these are not the CVE numbers. <laughs> Those are NSS IDs. We've actually gone ahead and masked the CVEs so that we can display this in a, a here or a cat and so forth in DEF CON and, and not have people you know, running out with their you know, iPhone photos of how to get through a SourceFire Palo Alto McAfee configuration. Um, so now we understand if we're, we're doing this model for somebody. This is my infrastructure. These are the exploits of the ones that we tested that we know get through all of these devices. Absolutely. And like, great, but does it actually target something that I have on the inside, right? So if this is all like half of these are like Java based and we use no Java inside of our company at all, this is kind of superfluous data. No, to worry, Stefan spent an extra night going ahead and plotting which vendors these apply to. So you can probably stop paying attention if you have McAfee, Palo Alto, and SourceFire, and you don't run any Microsoft. Um, 
probably don't want your employees using Adium for other reasons. <laughs> Adobe or Trend Micro, right? Obviously, the Microsoft ones are pretty bad. But let's find out how bad they are, because once again, Stefan spends an extra night writing another transform for us. And we can go through and we can say, great. And we can actually switch the view to something more fun to look at. We've now gone to the bubble view or the weighted view. In this particular view, and all the Maltigo users are pretty aware, the children are the child objects which point into my point, which are now growing in size, grow in size by the number of parents that they have. So this parent obviously has nothing coming into it, but this exploit does, right? It has several things coming into it. Now, <clears throat> why this is important? Well, we knew Microsoft had the most exploits that ran through it. Um, we know that Computer Associates only had one. These are the CVSS scores for the CPEs that are punching through. Quick reminder, it's a scale of 1 to 10. The amp doesn't go to 11. 10 is as bad as it gets. And everything that's 6 or above is considered stop, uh, stop everything that you're doing and find some way of fixing this in your infrastructure. The majority of the exploits that punch past that entire layer of de defense are from 7 to 10. Right? Getting pretty bad. Now, we know what gets through our defenses. We know what targets the systems that we have. We know that it's bad stuff. This isn't, you know, this isn't like it's going to pop up eyeballs from the eye pal appear on my screen and just be annoying. This is full on. Well, you know what? Let's just ask it what it is. So we're going to select the exploits again. Let's just ask what is the CWE for these things. Well, looks like uh, the majority of them are input validation issues and buffer errors. Probably not important. Yeah, it's probably, I, I wouldn't worry too much about it. And like shells opening up on my machine and exfiltrating data and installing other stuff. It's probably not that bad. So that's what we have, um, which is all fun and good right now. Now we're going to try another transform. And with such a small sample set of exploits that are left, I mean, if you guys had picked other vendors like, I don't know, IBM, which doesn't rhyme with anything other than IBM, and some others, I would have a lot more correlation because they have a lot more missed um, exploits. Um, and remind you, this is only a sample set of like 1,700 uh, CVEs. If we ran all 60,000 CVEs, I don't think I'd want to see what that looked like. I'd probably move on to Plan B, which is Log Cabin Mountain in Montana, Long Range Ranger. So, solar power. So here we go through, and we're going to run one of the other transforms that have been put together here, where we go through and we say, all right, Spiffy, let me know if any of these are in primer tools. Oh, we have a hit. We have a, we have a hit. Who, who would like to guess what that product is probably going to be? Metasploit? You think it's Metasploit? Who thinks it's Metasploit? It's probably Metasploit. All right, let's go find it. Normally I make lots of new little pages, but what color do you think it is? I can't see because the legend is on the legend. Is it the pink one? No, it's Eleanor. Oh, there's another one. Oh, there's another one. There's two. Oh, there's another one. Metasplit. We'll do this. We'll go back to where. This is what Boris asked when the are sold ahead of the trend protection. Uh, there are lots and lots of uh, exploits. Now we have a small sample set that are really in Metasploit. So as a security vendor, you never get better information than hey, it's in Metasploit, it's open source, you know, it works, it's scripting and stuff. And we just download it and test it. But still, we find that. Oh, yeah, sure. What, how many we have? Yeah, I'm doing, I'm doing all the oh, it's very 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 semi processors are they had to they had to, they had to, they had to kind of really work there. But all my cores got hot. Okay, I'm gonna track that to the comments. What do you think? I think it looks awesome. I just want that print. All right, that's the uh, world explosion of uh, what's being targeted by the whole set of exploits that are getting past any of these products. Because the reality of the situation is, you probably don't have. 
an NGFW, an IPS, and then a really well-tuned uh, endpoint protection sitting behind it. So we're going to go by exploits again. Let's see what framework tools are. We'll do some more fun modeling, and as we reach the end, we'll, you guys can toss out different things. Obviously, they're going to be hypothetical. It wouldn't be the actual configuration you use at work, so if you know who somebody is and where they work, don't, don't assume. It's always the elephant in the room. So there's 866 exploits currently inside of this way. You'll see later in one of our slides, it's 26%. 26% of the exploits within Metsploit generally go completely unblocked by most security products. That's like open book, that's like failing an open book test. Seriously. And by the way, when we run the tests, we're not doing any extra obfuscation. We're using the exploit at a Metasploit in our testing harness exactly as it's written in Metasploit. We're not tricky, we're not being mean. Right. Now we do have powwows and we do try and figure out ways of breaking things because that's what we do. But we we're, we don't we don't bend rules like that. We use Metasploit against you. It's that that fast. Uh, other tools that, that you guys have probably seen. There's no need to spend 100k on zero bit. Yeah, from like free, free Metasploit, or if you want to go spend 200 and something dollars, there's plenty of choices right here. So we'll go back to the actual presentation. It's fun. So layered security works really great, except for the holes, which tend to align. So why do the defense evasion model? Why invest in the security products? Well, you're gonna hear us harp over and over again a little bit today, and you're gonna constantly read it in our briefs that it's people, not technology, that's create the safeguarding of your company, the assets that you're trying to to, to guard. That's not just your security staff. That's the education of people that work in your company. I don't care if it's the clerk or it's you know the CEO's administrative assistant. But doing this modeling helps you under, understand what undetected exploits get past the security products that you're currently using today. Right? None of us believe for a second that these security products are foolproof. Understanding what targets the prevalent uh, applications that you use, so therefore, what are your vulnerable applications? This is important twofold. Number one, it may not be the fact that you need to go out and buy $10 million more of some other inline security product. It may mean that you're now going to go and spend $100,000 in operational costs. You're going to change your policies and procedures and practices, and you're actually going to address the problem because you now know that there is a problem. You're not sitting in the dark going, man, we got hacked. It must have been a zero day with an APT. China clearly came after my company, right? No, it was like some 12-year-old who bought Elmore for 250 bucks, scanned the internet, infected a website that your people went to. The exploit hit every one of your workstations because nothing you had in line protected it. And now they have all the data from your company. They have all the things. And then understanding what's automated in those primer kits. We can stop making the job of the 12-year-old who downloaded this stuff that much easier in life. Right, right in, the, in that VIN diagram, right in that center, you now finally can have the information of what gets through my security, what targets my applications, and then out of those, which are critical. Well, the ones that are critical are the most viable, meaning the most automated of them, right? Here's some examples of the, the way that we model some of the data. So we have undetected exploits within Metasploit. For all the green dots to include um, these other green dots over here, but you'll understand why they're a darker color. Those are the undetected exploits within Metasploit out of all the undetected exploits of all the products. Of the 866 Metasploit exploits, as many as 26% can go undetected by some products. Like if you could get your vendors to concentrate on just doing QC with nothing more than Metasploit, some of your products would be 26% better than they are today. That's pretty steep. Exploit availability and framework kit. So here we took a number of NGFWs and IPSs. 
these are the common exploits that they uh, that go undetected past those products that are already in prime markets. So here we point out Phoenix and Hello Eleanor. Of the 117 exploits attributed to popular prime markets, 43 are undetectable by 39% of the detection engines that we've tested. Remember, that's a representation of more than 80% of the active market. We're trying not to make the math hard. It should be scary. Targeted programs. Here we've taken, and the gray dots actually represent the programs. The green dots, once again, are undetected exploits. They're the software vendors that we've mapped out from the various different CVEs that we tested. We decided to show you Oracle and Microsoft. I mean, it's no surprise. It's not that they're bad. But if I was writing exploits and I was automating exploits, wouldn't I be picking things that have a huge install platform? That's exactly what it is. Or so, it's the opposite. Yeah. When the vendor, vendor always tells us, yeah, we, we can't block everything, but we prioritize according to criticality of what is important for our customers. OK. I understand you can meet some exploits against the Viet script that I wrote and published 10 years ago, but yeah. no, I wasn't For like that backup about. program that nobody uses anymore. But if you're prioritizing your patching and the security effectiveness of your product, why are you mostly missing Oracle and Microsoft? It's not like that's not what your customers are using. There's no zero day to day that you It's all you know. Yeah. Here we show correlation of detection failures. So once again, we've taken all the products that we tested that are in this database. We've gone ahead and pulled out all the exploits that they've missed. And again, this is the weighted bubble view. So the little tiny green dot that's undetected by one IPS. The big giant green dots, as they grow bigger, the bigger they are, the more IPSs miss that particular exploit. You'll see some pretty big dark, and of course it's Maltigo, so the gravity system works. So, so we just the released the paper uh, called Correlation of Detection Failures. What we did, we uh, used the data idea from Next Gen Fireball, IPS, and EEP testing. And uh, we made pairs of products. So uh, each against every one. So this is all the combinations. We removed duplicates. And we ended up with about 606 pairs of two products. And then we measured how many exploits go through. So of those 606 pairs, product pairs, only 19 or 3% managed to block all exploits with robot. I don't know about you, but I mean, I have run security for little tiny companies like Electronic Arts has like $5 billion in revenue. And then like Deluxe Entertainment, which if you ever watch movies at the end, there's that big red circle that says Deluxe, it's that company. Um, they're like some tiny little privately owned $4 billion a year company. And I did not have enough money in my budget to buy all 36 IPSs on the planet and then just put them in line, hoping that I could get, you know, 3% coverage, right? So nobody is at that level. Nobody can buy every single device. This one is always confusing to me, so I'm going to let you explain that. OK, this is, again, correlation of detection failures. Uh, here we look at the data from our next, uh, next gen firewall test. So we have tested the devices F1 to F9. Uh, vertical is the top 11 products, which collectively had the most exploits not detected. What we see here uh, for Microsoft, 62 out of 126, uh, no, it's uh, 62 products out of 126 had at least one exploit that has one of those devices. Uh, and of the total of 600 exploits, 107 were missed by at least one of those next gen firewall products. Or on the other hand, the ones in the red circle, they show that uh, none of those products managed all exploits against those vendors. So when you when you correlate it, uh, we find in the test data we find a very very strong correlation. So if you usually assume or if you do risk management and have no better data, say you have two devices, so device A has a failure rate of 10%, device B has a failure rate of 10%. So what's the failure rate if I put them in series? Most people go, oh, it's 10% multiplied by 10% is 1%. That would only be true if there was no correlation. There, there was absolutely no correlation. Unfortunately, it's still 10%. Or almost right. 10%. So, show of hands really fast. 
This is what Stefan likes to put together, right? So when we first looked at the data, this is what Stefan went running into our CEO's office with, and then they glazed over like donuts, right? Or Maltigo, which 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 like made the message better, right? Like, I love this stuff. You're awesome. I could I could never make myself do that. All right, so some of our conclusions and recommendations. And then we'll go ahead, we have some time left. We'll definitely open it to Q&A. We'll do some modeling for you. We'll do whatever you want, year over year. We'll play with the data, make it scary, take screenshots, take them back to the office. Yeah? Any plans to release the data? Um, yes. Uh, it'll, it's going to be added as part of our subscription service, but it will not become public domain. Um, we're still wrestling with some of the little nuances, like if I create this modeling tool and the, the transform, like you'd have to own Maltigo, right? And then you would be able to download our transforms and then act, utilize our transform database on the back end. Much like, um, much like Packet Ninja's, uh, you know, social networking system, right? So, you know, I've actually been, been speaking to Daniel, uh, so you, uh, about, you know, how we would copy the same kind of model. The, 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 the niggling issue that we still have, though, is if I put the real CVEs, because I'd have to do that to like help a consumer that was using this, right? Um, otherwise, my phone's going to be ringing, or somebody's like, what is 917642? Okay, that's CVE 07-142 you know, or something. Um, I, I got to make sure that I'm not now supplying. I mean, clearly, using this offensively is not like a brain twister, right? I, I can, without talking in between it, if you told me my target has this, 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 and this, in like under five seconds, I can tell you what malware kit to go get and just launch an active campaign against them. That is 100% chance of, it, of, of reaching its target, right? Oh, you have no idea. Like I've taken Sploitigo and hooked them together. So Sploitigo is a module instead of Maltigo that does pen testing. So when it uses Nmap to fingerprint the devices, I wrote a new transform that actually said, okay, take that fingerprint. I Nmapped and fingerprinted everything inside the lab. And then there was a transform called, does NSS have this? And it popped out the actual name and version of the product. And then you went right click, show me the exploits, right click the exploits, show me what primary tools can get that have this automated because I'm lazy. And it was like, I just did my pen test in like 45 seconds and I'm gonna bill you for the whole two weeks. Okay, <laughs> done, you know? Um, so again, that's the only thing holding us up right now is figuring out how do we do this without handing everybody a tactical nuclear weapon. So, conclusions for us. I don't care if you stay with your accent. <laughs> <laughs> okay, there are two sides. This is what vendors and the marketing slides claim, and this is what we find in our work and our research. So, we not only test the security, we also test the robustness, the stability of the products, so I uh, 10 gig device, well, that's nice, but when we test it, as of three gigs, it's a switch. This is the kind of information we have. So, more often than not, uh, statements from the vendors are, are very, very exaggerated. We have some, where it is the opposite, but the majority is ex ex exaggerated, peak the security or the performance. And as you know, uh, there's also a trade off between speed and security, and out of the box, they go for speed. Yeah. The devices are generally almost always configured for speed, especially inline devices, right? Because you can't make it stop and DOS your own network, right? Then it becomes a leveraging tool for me, the attack, right? Um, but of course, like Stefan was saying, we find the, when we do the performance testing, we'll find you know, a 20 gig device at a very premium price that only really works in mixed data traffic as a five gig device is one massively expensive five gig device, right? Um, the, you may have seen some like NSS employees, and then sometimes we give out the t-shirts. One of our t-shirts says it's hard to argue with a shell, and then it's a picture of the Microsoft shell. So when we run Metasploit, we pop shell on the machine. Uh, we will commonly have them go, yeah, well, we looked in our logs, and it says that exactly at the time you said you did launch it, we saw it, and we stopped the exploit. Really? Hold on. Boom. So the shell just opened again, right? You saw that? Yeah, but it says in my logs, okay, hold on. There, I did it again. There, I did it again. So now we just wear the t-shirts and point to them. I can't argue with the shell. I don't care what your logs say. Prevention is limited. No product or combination of products provides 100% protection, which means you should assume you are already compromised. If you believe you are not compromised, 
you're probably in the wrong business, and well, security is a market for lemons. So you probably have a pretty bright future either way. Knowledge is power. Defensive agent modeling, DEM, is critical for understanding your threat landscape. Understanding what gets through, to me, especially when I was a CISO, would have been far better than walking around every day going, God, I wonder what's gonna hit me in the back of the head, I wonder what's gonna hit me in the back of the head, I wonder what's gonna hit me in the, oh, the CIO has the wrong look in his eye, this is gonna be bad, right? That was like a, a thing. People, not always technology. We can't stress this enough, right? Technology can only detect what has been modeled before. We need people to recognize new threats and attacks. As we have seen some previous are very, very agile, they're very good in coming up with new attacks, with attacks out of our pocket. So if you don't have the, the right set of people, they can recognize, they can make sense out of pattern or out of observations, you do it. And we're not saying outsource, right? We're not saying just build an army of drones. We're saying find highly qualified, very well paid, very well taken care of security professionals. First class hires first class, second class hires third class. Third class people are not going to keep your network any safer than the products that you buy believing they're gonna stop not only zero days and APTs, but things that people haven't even written yet. Because if I go back to some of these transforms, and just for fun, I ask if what year those exploits came out. You're going to find telling me that you can stop a zero day that hasn't even been written yet is absolutely a joke. Wow, it actually, I think, choked my computer. Oh, there it goes. Oh. oh, 2005, welcome to the party. This is back here, 2000 as well. Yeah, these are. Open book no, no test, need for no need for zero days, right? I'll leave this slide up here even after we're done talking. These are uh, some links uh, to NSS's website where you can look at a lot of these white papers. They're free, um, as a lot of our papers are. Um, go read them, download them, use them around the office, point to them instead of Wikipedia when you're having an argument with somebody because that's actually tested. Um, unless you're one of those guys that send me Wikipedia links when we're having a debate, and I just laugh at you and I stop answering one. So, great, any questions or anybody wants to model something? Yeah? So, this type of analysis is really good at detecting how well a uh, vendor performs, but it yes. also seems like figuring out where the vendors are. Oh, I'm sorry, hold on. Oh, I'm sure. No, it's okay, I can speak up. Oh, okay. um, but it also seems really useful to see that the stuff is getting through and use that as prioritization for your security team's remediation efforts. Mm -hmm. Um, to that end, it seems really clear that Metasploit comes first and stuff you should yes. fix. Uh, how would one get, or what is an efficient way to get the other exploits that are not that readily available from the black kids? Ah. Um, we have another piece of research that we're not presenting today, but we did present it yesterday at BiPAP that we call threat forecasting. So in that case, we actually have, uh, calling it a honey net is just wrong, but it's the easiest way to get everybody to mentally visualize it. Um, where we can take your gold images of your servers and workstations and so forth and actually put in line the physical devices that you use, the endpoint products that you're using. Those systems then crawl the internet to malformed websites and so forth, and then we actually take those exploits and run them against your stack and your gold images and provide you with a threat feed, which is many threat feeds on the planet, but this one is actually your stuff. Right. And we can even tell you what would be the difference if running your stuff in North America versus running your stuff in China versus running your stuff in Iran versus running your stuff with a different language pack and it happens to go into North Korea. So we can, we can slice and dice that anyway. It's actually our testing rig that we use to test all the other products. In this particular case, we finally turned it into a product. It's another thing that's come out of uh, NSS going from a pure testing lab to now bringing on researchers that are taking what we're doing and figuring out different ways of reusing that data to enhance and make security better. Yeah. Do you have a transform that maps to patches and patches release? Um, no. Um, but unpatched fresh systems. Uh -huh. 
No, but what we do have is the ability to show eventually the CVEs, and then you could, we could probably make a transform very easily that would take you to the CVE entry on the, on the database website, and then you could read all about the patch and so forth. Yeah. Right. Especially if it's Microsoft, right? They'll like, here's like, click here to get the patch, this is the info, or go into the registry and change this key or whatever. That You won't find that in the modeling tool, I don't think ever, it's just, it's superfluous, right? It already exists out there, so we'll just point you at the source from the point. No need to reinvent the wheel. Yeah. So, um, you guys do a lot of performance testing. I'm wondering, you, and you touched on a little bit what the intersection is between like real world, how firewalls are configured versus exploits, because you did a really good job of explaining how you let their, their tuners come in and yeah. tune it. Most of the equipment that I encounter has serious operational configuration issues, yes. right? And and that was even with someone you thought was sane looking at it, right? They're like, I had to make hard decisions because of, you know, I have five minutes to do this. Okay. So is there a way to test that? Like the, this is a real world test, but the real world in the data center, this thing was set. Yeah, we, we actually have the data sets for the, the recommended settings, which so many people just go ahead and run with because they're afraid of causing an issue inside their own company when they stop something from working, especially with an IPS in front of users. Yeah. Um, so yeah, we just don't have that on the laptop. That You want to talk about ugly, 65 to 85% more dots appear on Well, the I think I'm, what I'm talking about is real world is actually sub-recommended. Oh yeah, no, yeah. absolutely. Um, we could, if you had a customer or was you yourself, and you said, look, okay. this is how we've configured our source fire. All right, great. Send us the send us the configuration file. Guess what? We have plenty of inside of our laboratory. Everybody's IPS and MGFW. Okay, that's a good point. So yeah, we can then rerun it and then provide you with that data set because it's it's just that would actually be there. very valuable because you could see like your initial recommended data and then you could say and here's where you measure up and we're not trying to scare you but it's significantly that's actually, Yeah, that's that's a really amazing point to make to somebody that we could actually take our data and say, look, this is base case scenario where you probably should be. This is where your device is measured. Like, and best case wasn't fun. Yeah, be, yeah best case was not fun. <laughs> so, great. Anybody else? Yeah. Um, I, to be honest with you, that was actually one of the better ones. If you take Checkpoint and Source Fire, or you take uh, um, Palo Alto and Source Fire, or so forth, um, when you start picking the products that constantly score massively well, like up in the way high 90 percentile, um, and put them together, um, that's doing well. Now, again, that's 2,000 CVEs. There's like 60,000 in the CVE database. So. How welling are the vendors, because this seems kind of like a new thing for you guys to go into the, this exploit stuff. Yeah. How, how are they dealing with this from a positive feedback and improving? We showed them this stuff, so the question was how are the vendors dealing with you know, this new way of modeling their, their, uh, the efficacy of their products. Um, we bring them in, we show them this, uh, they're very receptive. Uh, you know, some of them, I mean, it's, it's, it's no secret, some of them will come to us and ask how they our product. Right, and we're happy to talk to them and tell them because at the end of the day, we just simply want to see security get better. It's not like it's not like we're a priesthood. And that's what we do. We definitely get paid money, but at, at the end of the day, everybody that works at NSS, they're security researchers, pure and simple. Right, we just we want to see the products get better because it means we get to make a better, harder test. Right, so as soon as they get better, I just make the test harder. But right now, I can't make the test too hard because it's like picking on this located class. So <laughs> don't quote me on that. So, yeah, anybody else? Yeah. So one of the things that um, I've had a, an idea for, and I'll speak loud so everybody can hear, is there's a lot of different kind of macro approaches to doing security, right? Like, what works best? Hardening your system or putting antivirus on it or like whitelisting or like two types of things. So I missed part of the talk, so maybe, maybe, maybe we touched on it, but have you looked at doing that? And the idea that I had was kind of to get sandbox environment, run a bunch of malware on a bunch of different systems, and see like, okay, well this one's configured this way, this way, this way, this way. You know, which one blocks like 99.995? Yeah, I think I have like three minutes, and it would take me longer to answer that question. I'd be happy to talk to you okay. as soon as we're done, anybody else as well. I'll answer that happen. question in my presence. All right. Excellent. I don't want to steal a stuff here. Answer. <laughs> Our answer is nothing. Nothing. That, and that's, that is the answer. But the cool news is, if you do model it out, then you get really scared at how big the nothing is, uh, which is what we do every day. So I'm sure the presentation that he has will explain that as well. 
What about like more like the numbers you have are great and it goes back to 2005 and that's really important to show those CVs. But what about like the last 30 days, like fresh, still hot off the presses yeah. attacks? Right? getting because you're doing so, a lot of work on this. So this was this was an academic research project, so we had to have a control variable. Yeah. CVs. Yeah. Um, the modeling that we can do live, because of our big net infrastructure, we actually can show and model what is actually live happening on the internet right now. Really. Um, there's, we're discovering zero days constantly. We have no real way other than giving up NSS IDs of enumerating them. Um, but yeah, it goes from bad to worse. Now when we do a lot of our FSC checking, we actually are constantly using either CVEs or now recognized zero days, right? So like if Dooku doesn't necessarily have uh, CVEs and so forth attached to it yet, we'll still run it in the way that we've seen it packaged on the internet. Um, and we'll just mark it that way. Yeah, the data just gets better over time with that. Absolutely, yep. And then you see, then you see a lot of the old, the, those old things, they just come repackaged, literally, right? They repack them, they recompress them, they transmit them, so you wrote the signature to say, fine, if it comes across HTTP and it's this, then stop it, and then they're like, oh, okay, well, that's fine, I'll just send it through, uh, send it as an email attachment, because you're not watching SMTP, or I'll, now I'll put it on an encrypted website, so now it's HTTPS, congratulations, you're in, your inspection engine missed it completely because it wasn't looking in the HTTPS stream, even though it was decoding it, it was only looking for that exploit by definition in the HTTP stream. I mean, we see that all the time, especially with endpoint products. So it kind of blows your mind. It's like the same rule with like one change and the Boolean statement. It would work. So great. Anybody else? We'll be around. Come hit us up. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.